Luke chapter 5, verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And that, that name is the early name for Sea of Galilee. You've heard me say that. But the, the, the origin of the, the root word means harp-shaped. So like the lake was at that time shaped like a harp, and that's where it got its name. Okay, Just a little bit of uh, education. And saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's ship. Pay close attention to that. And prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, uh, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this, they, and when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their and their nets broke. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the sh- other ships, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they begin to sink. I just want to talk to you again from the subject, net and faith. Full of people get slammed by the Holy Ghost even when they didn't want to, okay? But if God has to come and knock you out of your seat, if you're that determined not to be moved by God, you're probably going to, you're going to wish you just went ahead and volunteered. We were, in a, I were in a revival many years ago, and there was a guy there, and some people come to me and say, hey, you know, there's, there's an atheist here. He's famous in town. Everybody knows he's an atheist. He teaches that. Anyways, going through all this stuff and, and, and telling me, I said, okay, that's great. Why is he here? He's, he's here because, um, you know, he heard about you coming, and people were talking about miracles that had happened in a town next door and, and different stuff, and he's here to debunk all of that. And I said, okay, well, I'm glad this isn't left up to me. Because I can't debunk all that. Amen? I'm not going to be able to prove God is real. God's going to have to show up and prove God is real. Amen? And this, it was pretty cool because, because in, in, in that, I never, <laughs> and, and I'll get part of this has been 20 years ago. Oh, Lord, no longer than that. 23, four years ago. So I won't get all the predictors right because I've had experiences with about three different atheists in meetings, and they all, something different happened to all of them, but they all got up and left believing there was a God, every one of them. So I, so I may get this, a little bit of this story mixed up, but, but it was like this, 2001, and, 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 and we were preaching, and, and and at some point, we're, we're praying, and, uh, and I made the statement. I knew he was there. I don't usually preach to the crowd. I just preach what God gives me. But I knew he was there, and I made the statement when I was making the altar call. I said, if you don't believe there's a God, just get in this line. And here he comes. So I'm praying. I'm going down through there praying for people, and I'm thinking, okay, God, here we go. I opened my big mouth. Now it's up to you to bail me out. Ever been there? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> I've done that a bunch, by the way. I, it happens here sometimes. You'll never know it, but I'm telling you. <laughs> and so, so I'm just like, and I'm going down there praying for people, and I'm just like, Lord, you got to show up. You got to show up. You got to show up. And when we get there, I just laid hands on him. I didn't feel anything. I, 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 in fact, it felt like a wall. I don't know if you ever prayed for anybody. It feels like a wall. And he was just like, oh, my goodness, this is crazy. And I'm pushing it and and nothing. And I'm like, Holy Ghost, do something. And he went "Mm," like that. And I thought, there we go. Plug him in. Come on. And I just started praying in tongues over him. Well, he opened his eyes and looked right straight at me. Like, what in the world are you saying? If you're an atheist and you've never been to Holy Ghost Church, I mean, what would you do? I mean, I've seen Baptists react like that. Amen? This guy, this guy don't believe there is a God. And so, <laughs> it, listen, I was, I was a pretty young evangelist. We hadn't been out there very long, so it wasn't, I, I didn't have wisdom just dripping off my elbows. And I said, close your eyes. <laughs> Close your eyes. 
It was messing with me. I'm sorry. It's just, you ever tried to pray for somebody and they stare at you? Stop that. You're distracting me. God may not show up if I'm distracted. And he said, no. Oh, well, that was all I had. <laughs> what are you? And I, at some point, I remembered something that happened in a revival back in 1997 where a guy that had said he didn't believe in God or at least was agnostic, uh, uh, an evangelist had prayed over him and said, put your hands in the air and say, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. And the guy started saying it. I love Jesus. You know, he's just looking. He wasn't looking around, but you could tell he wasn't into it. Anyways, I won't go through that whole story, but that was powerful too. But when, so I, that's all I could think of. So we have these experiences for a reason. So I said, listen, do me a favor. I know you don't want to, but close your eyes, put one hand in the air and just say, I love Jesus. And he looked at me like he wasn't going to do it. And I said, listen, I told you if, you, if you didn't believe there was a God, get in this prayer line. If you listen to my instruction, I think God's going to do something in your life. And he said, okay. So he closed his eyes. He put that one hand like this, and he said, I love Jesus. I said, say it again, because I'd watched this evangelist do that very thing. I said, say it again. He said, I love Jesus. I said, say it again. He said, I love Jesus. I said, say it again. And he took this hand, and he went, I love Jesus. And the Holy Ghost showed up. But when it was over, the pastor went and asked him, wouldn't talk to him. He said, what happened? And he said, I don't really know. But whatever it is, I'm pretty sure now there's a God. Amen? There are times when God will push in and do something like that. But to be honest with you, there was a lot of participation, even though he wasn't, I was, the worship team was, and every Pentecostal spirit-filled believer in the house was watching. And they were all praying in the Holy Ghost. So we had a, he didn't know it, but he was kind of set up from the start. Amen? A powerful experience. But as as it usually goes, we get what we re- we get what we are capable of receiving. We will God will fill us up to overflowing, but it's up to us to expand the vessel. Are you listening? It's up to us to to give Him more room to move. And the way we keep the way we keep our cup small is sticking to everything we know. Say that again. The way we keep our cup small is sticking to all the things that we think we know about God. All right? So here's Peter. Now think about this for a minute. We've talked about all kinds of things. I told you last week that if Peter would have caught fish in the middle of the night, he would have brought them in, took his fish, because you can't just leave them laying in a boat for you know for infinite time. So he would have brought his fish in, got his fish out, left, and there would have been no boats there for Jesus to get into. All right? So I told you that. So it was a God's timing thing. What we didn't talk about, and this is something that God brought to me actually on the way home last week. He said, here's the next thing I want you to talk about. You talked about what it would have meant if Peter had gone home and he wasn't, and, 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 and the boat wasn't there. I couldn't have spoke the word to all those people that were out there. He said, have you thought for a second what Peter's life would have ended up being had he caught fish in the middle of the night? And I said, to be honest with you, no. And he said, that's what I want you to focus on. He said, because the reality is, he said, Peter wasn't had. Now, listen, we preached about this. Peter's going to his favorite fish. Listen, if you think he's not tried every spot that he's caught fish at before, you're crazy. Now, listen, I'm not a great fisherman, but I got a handful of places that I've caught fish consistently. And before I give up, I go to all those spots. And I use all the same baits that I've caught fish on before. And if none of that works, well, I don't live far from the lake. It's time to go home. Amen? I'm not the most patient fisherman, so I'm just telling you. Okay? It's the way it is. But the Bible says, and I'm sure enough not going to spend all night long not catching anything. I fish for fun, not for a living. 
after about three hours of not catching any fish, it ain't fun. Are you with me? It's the way I feel about it. So I'm going home. But Peter fished all night long because, and, and, and so he's, he's deployed his nets in every place. He's tried all the same spots, all the holes, all the places that always produce for him. And we preached an entire message on that, going understanding that sometimes things you've done for years are no longer producing. Are you listening? That's how this little talk started about camp meeting. You listen to me. I believe that God, in, God, how do I say this? I believe if you come looking for God in anything that you're looking for, it's one of the reasons that people have recipes that they do. You know, I fast three days and I only drink coffee at 8 a.m. and I do communion at 6 8 p.m. and then they see a miracle happen in their life and see it works. It's a formula. Or maybe it just worked because that's the only time you have faith. <laughs> oh, that'll wreck your whole mess, won't it? Maybe, just maybe, it worked because you thought it was going to work. Just maybe if you would got up the first morning and said, you know what, God, I'm going to skip all that. I believe you. Amen. Now, I'm not telling you it's not good to fast or anything like that. So don't go, I'm just telling you, don't get caught up in formulas and old, it, it, it just don't do that. Okay? God is God. He's a supernatural God. What he needs you is to believe, you, you need to believe in him. And he'll do supernatural things. Amen? So Peter's done all this stuff, and it didn't work for him. It was not because, now listen, I, you know, the chosen kind of had a deal uh, in there is, uh, where maybe the fishermen weren't supposed to be fishing either in that area or that time of night or whatever. I've heard that before, but I don't know how to prove that, okay? I'm not sure that that's, that's, that that's real. I, I, I tend to think God was not out there making, uh, uh, how do I say this? God was not making sure the fish didn't bite because Peter needed an intervention. Let me say that again. I don't think God was intervening because Peter was misbehaving. Can I say that again? I don't think the reason he couldn't catch any fish was because Peter was misbehaving. I think the reason he couldn't catch any fish was because God didn't want Simon the fisherman to stay Simon the fisherman. God wanted Simon the fisherman to become Peter the apostle. And if, are you hearing me this morning? So sometimes what you've been doing doesn't work anymore. It's not because you're in trouble. It's not because everything's changed. It's not because you're somehow God's trying to intervene. It's because God is trying to move your reliance from something that you think you know you should do or something you think you ought to do a certain way to his will. Maybe that's the whole point after the, afterwards. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, God was just trying to change Peter's reliance. Quit trusting that net. Quit trusting that boat. I'll show you. I need you to trust me. Amen? Can you imagine what Peter's life would have been like if he had just filled the boat up in the middle of the night? We wouldn't be reading. We wouldn't be teaching. We wouldn't be talking about what happened. The great apostle, Simon, who became Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Amen? And in that, in that expression, God, Jesus uses, he talks about Petros, Petra and Petros, which he uses to declare that I have, I'm, you're, I'm building my church on the revelation that I'm the Son of God, and you're a little rock. In other words, you are a rock, you're a foundational building block to build that church and express that kingdom. Amen. How does Peter get to be a rock if Peter's fishing business is still going well? Maybe just maybe. Peter, God just had a different plan. God just needed to take what Peter was used to and flip it upside down so that Peter would become reliant on him. Amen? That, listen, I'm 18 minutes in. If I quit now, you guys are just all swoon and faint, and then we... I may try that. You guys, we'll just call it the move of God. Everybody be coming up here 
They all fell out in the spirit. No, they were just surprised, Pastor. They just... <laughs> Shock and awe. That's a good one. I like that. I may, I may use that. Amen. But I am, I am almost done. I promise. Those of you that go here know what that means. You visitors, I've given you some hope. I, uh, oh boy, I got to skip that. That is a 45 minute point. We're going to go this last one right here. Maybe that's installment number five. So let's think about it for this minute. In your own life, then let's apply it for a minute. Maybe, just maybe the things that you tried and whether it's relationship or business or whatever, ministry, uh, maybe some of the things that you used to work for you that doesn't work anymore, don't work anymore. That's my Arkansas coming out in me. I don't think Dutton's a word, is it? I caught myself. <laughs> Half the crowd's like, I thought it was. It's a colloquialism. It's all right. Maybe it's just that God is trying to make an apostle out of a fisher. Maybe your failed fishing trips don't have anything to do with catching fish. Maybe they have everything to do with the development of the anointing that God's trying to put on your life. Maybe literally what's going on is God knows if the fishing's still good, he's not going to be able to get you out of the boat long enough to take over. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be honest with you. I like being in the driver's seat. I, whatever, I'm just telling you, I like being in the driver's seat. Now, Sister Karen didn't say amen because she knows the first 25 years we were married, I drove everywhere. It's a man thing. <clears throat> Get in the truck, I'm driving. <clears throat> got this beautiful lady riding beside me, I'm driving. Last five or six years, I got my feet up on the dash. Ask her. I said, I got my 25 in, you got the next 25. It's funny how things that, that you think so important become not so much important anymore. We change, amen? But I like being in charge. I got, especially if I built something. If I built it, if I made it, if I created it, if it's something that God used me to create, then I like, I like having to say so about how things go. I think any driven person does that to some extent. But I've also found out something, that the things that the best, the greatest blessings I've ever had in my life are not when I'm in the driver's seat. Let me tell you, this, I about said closing again, and then you guys would just say, huh? <laughs> The business that my brother and I own and, and our two wives were equal partners in that and there was an, an expansion opportunity back several years ago and I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. I mean, a lot of the one in Arkansas was had to do with, you know, I made, you know, a lot of decisions, especially on the buying and stuff, but I just, I didn't want to do, it, it was a, it was more than I wanted. And so I was just like, God, I'm, you know, I'm in charge here. <laughs> We're not doing that. And then I gave him all the reasons why. You know, it could be distracting. You know, listen, I'm working for you. This is ministry, you know, whatever. I told him all that stuff. And he's just like, you know, why am I even here? If you're not going to listen to me, why am I here? But that list I gave you, God, was a good list. I had some really good points. Right. So eventually, he just kept making it more and more impossible not to. It's almost like he made it more and more impossible. So we decided to do that. And, and in 
that I've never that I know of. I've never told this story. So we bought that business up there, and 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 that's that's a whole different animal than what's down here, and it's a lot larger place, and so there's a lot more to it. Literally, product wise. It's four to five times amounts of semis product that goes through there than it ever did anything down here. It's one of the reasons I didn't, you know, I'm getting, I'm going, I'm getting closer to retirement when it comes to the business, business stuff. I'm not wanting more. Are you listening? So anyways, so I, we make the effort, we go and I won't tell you how, you know, but we had to put a large sum of money down, which took everything we had basically and this is on January 15th of 2020. The way that business operates is that it's, it's, an, it's an auction, a building materials auction business. You do your first three that basically pay for everything that you're going to sell for the rest of the year, and your last two basically are, are profit within, within reason. And, and the first one's the biggest one, largest one. It takes the most, I mean, it's somewhere close to 25 or 30 semi-loads of product that move in about six hours. It's, if you've never been there, it's a huge deal, and 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 so we go we go all in. We take all of our, all the money we invest. I mean, more. I'm, so I'm calling Amex. I'm calling PayPal. We got loans everywhere to make this happen. It's a lot of money. On top of that, the man who owned the business sold all of his product or sold most of his product down so that we had to get new inventory. Well, I can tell you new inventory for the first auction is around $300,000. That's what it takes to just get the inventory to do it. On top of the fact that we had already put in about three hundred and fifty. on top of the fact that we had a bunch of money. So long story short, I had we had about $742,000 that was going to be owed in the next 60 days. Now you know why I told God, this is not a good idea. I don't know what you're doing, but this is not a good idea. But, listen, we felt, my, Chad, at one point in the, in, in the, and I'll tell you when, but at one point in there, Chad's like, well, it's, it, you know, God's got to take care of us. We flipped every fleece, and we did them about six times, and we still come up with this. True. We tried every way in the world to make it not work, to make it fail, and God just made it, made it, made it work. So now we're getting ready. We got all this product. We got all this stuff. I owe all this money. No big deal. I'm going to do that first auction. It's a, it's a major one. It would Normally, that first one would pay about half that tab, would allow us to reset credit lines, and we would just go on and do a couple more, and then we'd pay, you know, and then, and then, and then part of the rest of the business was, was, was paid out over the next four years. And so <clears throat> I just had to hit that 740 mark by, by, <laughs> by June. And it's January. And so we get ready. We got the whole building packed. We start to put out advertising. We set in, in, in on the first week of February, decided the date of the first auction needed to be March 15th, 2020. It's been a while. Does anybody remember what March 15th, 2020 was? First shut down nationwide to slow the spread. And the city called me and said, whoa, can't have an auction. Can't get them people. You have hundreds of people in there rubbing up against each other. Can't do that. So now I'm trying to figure out, okay, whoa. I'm thinking about being the preacher who got thrown in jail for being defiant. But listen, I, I'm just telling you. But I, so I said, whoa, whoa. You don't understand. Well, you know, it'll probably be all right in a couple months. You can just have one then. Really? Remember, 60 to 90 day money, not, we'll just go get some more. And do, oh, Where? I barely found that. And so I, I'm just, so then I call Chad and we're talking about it and that's when he makes the statement, well, God's got God's to help us. We flipped fleeces. We prayed about We did everything we knew to do to make sure it was his will. We decided that's what it was. Now he's got to help us. I agree. That's a great statement. I believe it. And then we calmed back down and said, where are we going to get $742,000 in the next 60 days? I hung up the phone, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, 
I need you to place an ad on Marketplace, Facebook Marketplace. I've done that. I need you to place it for shiplap. It's a product that we sell. Most of you may know what that is, but it's shiplap. I said, okay, okay, God, I've done this before. I have done this before. I, I, placed, I placed many ads for shiplap many times. And, and it'll produce, over the course of a couple of months, it'll produce six, $7,000 worth of sales. It's great if you don't owe any money. And so I'm arguing with the Holy Ghost. I'm sitting in, in, in what was Shalin's old room in the top of the big house, and I'm sitting up there looking out across the lake, and the Holy Ghost says this, and I said, God, this won't do it. And I felt that, you know, like somebody's burning holes through the back of your neck, but there wasn't anybody there. Okay. So I got on Facebook, I placed an ad, shiplap, certain dollar a foot, whatever it was, you know, several thousand feet to sell, call this number. I posted it. Within nine minutes, I got my first phone call, and for the next six weeks, people called my phone almost every single day, including Sundays, for six weeks straight. I had, we had things happen that never happened before and never happened since. I had, I had one man show up to buy a bundle, literally, a bundle of shiplap who began to walk through the warehouse and said, I'll take that and I'll take that and I, I need about five of those and I need about that. But time is over. We loaded up a semi and a half. And by the time we got to have our first auction about five weeks later, we'd collected about $450,000. Then we had our first auction, and it broke every record in the history of the company, even after we sold all that product, and before it was over, we had $750,000. Not a single thing I thought would work would have worked, and everything I thought wouldn't work worked when God said do it. Maybe, just maybe, God's just trying to change your reliance. I believe that that word spoken, and I've never even told him that, when he made the statement, well, God's got to help us because we did his will. I believe that triggered something in the heavenlies. God put it in my brain, and immediately the Holy Ghost started working. Church, I can tell you I've owned that business for five years. Nothing like that's ever happened since. I've run all kinds of ads. We sell product. God has used that to be the greatest financial blessing of my lifetime. But nothing like that's ever happened. Why? Because Jesus stepped in the boat and said, I need you to launch out in the deep. This morning, the challenge is just that. When will you quit trusting yourself? When will you quit trusting what you know and who you know? I'm not telling you to stop being efficient. I'm telling you to trust Jesus. Would you stand with me, please?